I did this in four minutes on news talk this afternoon, but I'm not going to try that again. But it, it, it will be, it will be, I mean, there is a glass of wine for all of you and a glass of welcome at the back of the, at the back of the hall. So we'll, we'll make haste. Um, so it will be sketchy and a bit disjointed, but I hope you will. Uh, it's right and fitting that on the 70, what is it, the 75th anniversary of Miguel's death, or 70th? Uh, 50th, sorry, 50th, uh, that we should mark him. The school, obviously, every year marks Miguel. I often get... Uh, people saying, you know, this isn't about McGill at all, and it's, uh, you know, and it's not about, and he would have turned this grave were he to see some of the people you have up there on the platform. Uh, probably would, but <laughs> McGill was a very worldly man, actually, <laughs> once he got going. Uh, he wasn't, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how. But then anyway, I'm going to begin by reading this little note that he, he left when he was going off to France in 19, March 1915. It's a will, and a lot of soldiers did it on a jot or whatever they could find at the time. In the event of my death, I give the whole of my property and effects to Miss Margaret Gibbons, 2A Hillfield Mansions, Hillfield Road, West Hampstead, London. 9th of March, 1915, Patrick McGill, Rifleman No. 3008, London Irish Rifles. It was witnessed by another rifleman, Hugh Millington. He wrote another one as well, at my, Southampton, March 9th, 1915. My dear John, just to scroll before the troop ship goes, we are off to France tonight and things may happen before I get back, if I may and I may not get back at all. In that case, I have made a little will, one that is legal for a soldier on active service, and I send you a copy in case the original is lost. Yours ever, Patrick. I read these two things before going back to the beginning because they are the two people, I suppose, in McGill's life who were to become the most important. One was the woman he was to marry, Margaret Gibbons, uh, whom he met at, I think, was reviewing her book of fairy stories. She lived in Hampstead uh, of Irish Catholic origin. And the other, my dear John, was Canon Sir John Dalton, who was in Windsor Castle. And Canon Dalton was chaplain to Queen Victoria, who then got him to be the tutor to the two princes, George and Edward, and indeed he went on a cruise with them, uh, and uh, he was sent with them in order that they would not be bullied, etc., etc., by other people on board. He was extremely close to King George V, one of the closest people to him. So therefore, he was a man, a high Tory, and had taken over then the chapter library, St. George's Library in Windsor, and other, had other responsibilities. So he was, uh, he was a very valuable member of the royal family, in other words, and went on holidays to Balmoral and so on. Uh, and I'll come back to that because it, this is one of the most extraordinary stories of Irish letters, really. Uh, Margaret... Then Margaret Gibbons, obviously, on the instructions of Patrick, wrote to Canon Dalton as well, saying, Dear Canon Dalton, this is again the 9th of March. They were preparing uh, for the eventuality that Patrick would not return. And by this stage, he had property. 
By this stage, he had been the author of a best-selling, a best-seller, Children of the Dead End, and he was making money in other ways, and he wrote, uh, he wrote articles for newspapers and so on, and she was also a writer. My dear Canon Dalton, Patrick left for the front at 2.30 today and asked me to write to you in his stead as he was so pressed for time. He always was pressed for time. He has thought of a plan for sending over some, uh, some articles which shall escape the censor as far as possible. In other words, Patrick set out for the front but already with the intention of using the experiences to write more. I am sending you his last letter because I don't want a hitch to occur. You will be able to see exactly what he means and, of course, will see that the letters reach me as soon as possible after you have read them. This is a very private letter to send you, I know, but I think that you will understand. Patrick loves you very much, and I didn't think that you were so nice as you are until I met you. It will be a time of fearful anxiety until he comes back, and the fact that thousands upon thousands are sharing the same feeling does not make it even a tiny bit easier. In case the funny names puzzle you. We, we Wiggles is my pet name, and Huey is a little elf that roams the hills of Glen. Stood around in the, the market square in Straban. There was a clock tower there, indeed I remember it. Uh, and then a farmer would come up, sometimes feel their bodies to see if they had any signs of weakness or illness. I mean, they didn't want problems during the six months, and they wanted people to be fit. They wanted the kids to be fit to work. Uh, so it was a pretty crude system. Some people will argue that, you know, that's the way it was. Uh, they were there to hire, and the children were there to be hired, and this brought a bit of money to help rear the other children and so on. Anyway, McGill, I mean, this system was complained of by many people at the time, uh, including a priest in the Rosses who said, this is disgusting. Uh, this is like preparing turkeys for Christmas, the children watching their children until they were of an age to go and then, uh, and then send them to the hiring fair. But uh, McGill would come back on all of this in his first novel, which became a bestseller, Children of the Dead End. And I'll just read a little flavor of it. He called the hiring fair the Calvary of mid tyrone And uh, the, the, there's this family, an old man and a boy and girl, and they have a son and daughter, according to McGill, for sale. The girl looked pale and sickly. She had a cough that would split a rock. Ara, will you wish that coffin, said her brother, time and time again. Sure, no, sure you know no one will give you wages if you go on in that way. The father never spoke. I suppose he felt there was nothing to be said. During one of these fits of coughing, an evil-faced farmer who was looking for a female servant came around and asked the old man what, wage, what wages did he want for his daughter. There was a bargaining thing here. Five pounds, said the old man, and there was a tremble in his voice when he spoke. And maybe the cost of burying burying her, said the farmer, with a white laugh as he passed on his way. Uh, so it was a, a pretty, uh, as I say, barbarian system. McGill got hired. He was hired twice. He was hired in one instance by uh, a man he called in his book when he would come to write about it, Joe Bennett. Uh, the man in reality was Joe Young. 
he had about 30 or 40 acres outside Oma. And he was uh, not great land, but I mean, he had enough and he lived with his sisters and so on. And they needed a youngster, obviously, to, to help with the farm. And, but he was as mean as hell. And uh, Miguel uh, complained of never having enough to eat, of being mistreated and so on. In general, it has to be said, the people who hired the children did look after them reasonably well and sometimes very well, but then, then on the other hand there were those who didn't look after them at all. And there was very little that the children could do. They could run away, but run away to what? And then if they were caught up with, they would be brought back and so on and so forth. So that's, that's, that's how McGill started off. The next stage, in this was the traditional classical pattern for children growing up in this part of Ireland. The next stage would be to Scotland, when they would be old enough, to the Tattyhoken fields. And the Tattyhoken was potato picking, obviously, in the lowlands of Scotland. And uh, there was quite a, a lot of work in this to be done. And, of course, the Scots themselves were more interested in the industrial work, better paid, better conditions, and so on. Uh, and Scotland was booming at the time. Uh, we're talking about 19, 1908, 1906, 1908. Uh, but uh, McGill, uh, and the system again here was a very odd system. It was a kind of a bartering system. The, people, the young people going to Scotland to the Tatty Hogan were organized by a local gaffer. There, were, there was a gaffer, for example, up the glen, a neighbor of McGill's. And they would do the bargaining with the farmer in Scotland. So in other words, they were the middlemen. So they got paid and they in turn paid the children. So you can see right away, you know, the, the possibilities for, for abuse. But uh, they went off, and uh, uh, just to, to give you a flavor as well, they, they took the dairy boat. Dairy was, dairy was really, I suppose, the capital of this whole area. And, that, of course, partition partition put an end to that and you'll see some of this reflected in the exhibition that we have here but they took the dairy, the dairy boat which was another very rough brutalizing experience because of the fighting, the drinking uh, the, they shared the boat very often with cattle and so on and so forth so um, McGill's first, of course dairy was a revelation to these kids they hadn't seen a, a town as big as this. So it was their first taste of seeing these fine buildings and so on. But anyway, the dairy boat was the next stage. And he says, the row between O'Donnell and Jim, these were um, people in charge of them, was only the beginning of the wild nights fighting. All over the deck and down in the steerage, the harvestmen and laborers fought with one another for hours and end. Over the bodies of the women who were asleep in every corner, over coils of ropes, tr trunks and boxes of clothes, the drunken men struggled like demons. God knows what they had to quarrel about. When I could not see them, I could hear them falling heavily as cattle amid a jumble of twisted hurdles until the drink and exertion overpowered them at last. One by one, they fell asleep just where they had dropped or on the spot where they were knocked down. So, McGill uh, and, of course, I mean, the, the awful story of Kirk and Tiller, which was to happen to a group of youngsters from Mayo. Some of you will be familiar with it in 1927, I think it was, or 37. Sorry, my memory is not what it was. Where 10... There were about 20 odd children lodging. The, 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 the buyers were cleared to lodge the children and made comfortable with straw and so on. 
This accident in Kirkontilla, there were 20 odd uh, children from Mayo and a fire broke out because they had to cook their food in there. And uh, in order to preserve morality, imagine as if there were any morality in any of this, they divided the girls from the boys. So the boys had been locked in to another room and the girls were outside in another room. And a fire broke out inside and all of the boys were burnt to death, watched through a hole in the wall by sometimes their sisters. One, one girl had three brothers burnt inside. Uh, and, you know, there was an outcry of this, and there were periodically outcries about these conditions, and there were inquiries. I suppose it's like the, 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 all the, what do you call them, the tribunals and so on. And, but nothing ever. The, 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 these things... These things were complained of in newspapers in Mayo and Donegal up to the, certainly the late 50s or, or early 60s. Uh, anyway, McGill, uh, uh, the, the only Scots people who maybe they would have encountered, or almost the only, were the down and outs from the, the Glasgow slums who wouldn't get a job anywhere. And McGill writes very movingly about a woman called Gurak Ellen, who obviously, you know, was a prostitute by times and so on. And McGill judged her very harshly and then said how sorry he was having passed judgment so quickly once he got to know the woman and that she had a... It's all of that that McGill was working through, still at the age of 15, 16. Uh, the, the then... Uh, the, uh, the, peop uh, the Irish men and women then graduated again to the, the industrial schemes where real money was to be earned. And there was one big, big hydroelectric scheme. And again, these continued right up to the 50s. My own father worked in, in some of them. And... Um, uh, this, this, one, this one was Kinloch Laven, and uh, you would probably know, know it, yeah. And these places were hundreds of huts where the men, were, they descended on these wild places in the highlands to build these big, uh, it was a hydroelectric scheme, I think, if my memory serves me right. And McGill went there, and uh, he was working. Although, if, if you look at him, I mean, he was reckoned to be a wrestler as well to, uh, during this time. But I can't, I can't see him performing this kind of work. But anyway, he was there, living in these conditions, but uh, beginning to observe. And... Uh, he was note-taking, and he actually wrote a few articles on this big scheme and the men, uh, the men working in the rough conditions, the navvies who were not part of society, who were isolated from society, and according to McGill, were building for society. These like somebody, a man called Crowley has written a book, The Men Who Built Britain. Well, these were the men who built Britain, many of them Irish, of course. And, but he wrote a few articles because during this time he began Scotland. Scotland was a place where the Carnegie libraries were everywhere, in Greenock and Glasgow, established by the philanthropist and Andrew Carnegie. And McGill, he had come from a house where his mother was always reading. And she had to read in secret because it wasn't kind of the done thing for a woman to be reading during the day or whatever. So, and all the work she had to do raising children. Uh, but uh, he uh, wrote a few articles that arrived in London 
and it were published in London. But also in the meantime, I'm jumping ahead, in the meantime when he was working on the railway line, he had left Kinloch Laven working on the railway line, uh, the, Gra the Glasgow Greenock railway line, and he started writing bits of poetry. He had picked up, he had picked up a verse by Kipling, very popular at the time, and Robert Service. So he started writing on back bits of paper and so on. And he was going to libraries, and there was a, a the librarian in Greenock was a man called Leighton, and it is reckoned that he took him under his wing and tried to coax him and so on and, and encourage him. And he was listening to the speeches, the socialist speeches, uh, that were at this time very common. Uh, the so John McLean's Socialist Federation uh, had, begun, had been founded and, you know, with the industrial environment and so on, uh, socialism was taking root big time. So McGill was coming under all these influences and was obviously very bright. In fact, you know, probably was a genius in many ways. And the, 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 he published then this little volume, uh, Gleanings from a Navi Scrapbook. And it was published by P. McGill, sixpence net. And it was published by the, it was printed by the Dairy Journal. And he hawked it around Greenock. And he managed to sell eventually 8,000 copies. So, I mean, amazing determination. And in the book, there's obviously the, uh, the, the uh, he, say, he begins, gentle reader, the fact that everything has been said about everything does not naturally suggest that everything has been sung about everything. And because of that, I leave this little volume at the mercy of the multitude and you. Someday, when I become famous, I will take immense pleasure in reminding the world, like Mr. Carnegie, that I started at the lowest rung of the ladder, or as is more correct, and looking for the spot where the ladder was placed. But for the present, the least said about it, the better. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's remarkable in many ways in that you have uh, translations of La Fontaine's poetry, of Victor Hugo's poetry, and uh, uh, I mean, he did it with the help of a dictionary. Uh, and uh, just, and uh, then some, some about Ireland, of course, and he always wrote about his native place. Uh, but uh, it's an amazing, uh, an amazing effort, but it got to the notice of critics in London who found this because of the story behind it. A Navi, a young Navi of 19, writing this kind of thing. And that began, he began to be known, and particularly in socialist circles. These articles then, uh, um, that were sent to London and appeared in a in, uh, in newspaper, I've forgotten which one, led to his being contacted by the then editor of the Daily Express, A.C. Pearson, and he was offered a job in the paper. So he went to London, took up the job in the paper. They obviously wanted this guy to write about raw realism, etc., etc. So uh, they... they uh, but they didn't use them properly. They sent them out to cover dog shows and cat shows and sent them to the opera under a heading, the Navi poet goes to opera, you know, dressed up in a dicky bow and so on and so forth. So Miguel Roberto has been, you know, the, mo the monkey and the organ grinder. And, uh, you know, he just, he got fed up with the whole thing. He couldn't stand it. It lasted about three months. But in the meantime, these, this little volume got to, uh, to uh, it got around, and it got to jo John Dalton. 
in Windsor. And John Dalton was an extraordinary man. His son, Hugh Dalton, would become the first Labour Party Chancellor of the Exchequer. It didn't last very long in the, in the job because he gave an interview to a reporter giving away the details of the budget. Sounds familiar. <laughs> but uh, Hugh Dalton was a powerful figure in the Labour movement, obviously have, having inherited these principles from his father. And the father, according to Hugh Dalton, his father knew no privilege, didn't recognise privilege even though he was a high Tory, all his family had been military people. Or he was, his full name was John Neal Dalton, N-E-A-L-E, -E, and the Neals were all military people and so on and so forth. Remarkable man. And he was about 71 when McGill first made contact with him. And uh, Hugh Dalton in his autobiography tells the story that uh, uh, the cannon was going around Windsor and Found, went into this lodge and the lodge keeper's wife was ill in bed and he took a bucket and brush or whatever and got down and mopped the floor himself. <laughs> An extraordinary man. So he was drawn to McGill, not only McGill, I mean it was said that he had homosexual tendencies but there is certainly no evidence that I have found anywhere. Uh, but he was drawn to people like this, according to his son. So obviously, he contacted McGill, and uh, he uh, offered him a job. He said, come and work for me in the library at Windsor Castle. And uh, McGill said, wrote to him and said, dear, it was still dear Cannon, you're just doing this, you know, no, uh, you're doing this just to help me. Uh, you know, there's no job or I can't do that or whatever. Cannon insisted, brought Patrick McGill to Windsor Castle, installed him in the cloisters uh, and paid him for, trans for copying Latin manuscripts from the 15th and 16th century. And those exist still today in Windsor. And when I told many years ago the then librarian in Windsor, Mrs. Bond, that about this, she couldn't believe that he could have, with so little education, co even copied these. Uh, but there was no record, according to them, that he ever worked there or there was no record of money or anything else. So this was all Canon Dalton. McGill would become almost a son to Sir John Dalton. And they, they corresponded throughout their lives from that on. And Canon Dalton would look after McGill's affairs. Uh, McGill produced this second little volume, Songs of a Navy, and again by Patrick McGill this time, published by P. McGill for Cloisters Windsor. It doesn't say Windsor Castle, but most people would have known. And uh, I won't quote anything because I think I'm going over time. But uh, this, this relationship developed in an extraordinary way. And... Uh, when that's why the letters were written to John Dalton because he was the one who looked after the financial affairs of Patrick and uh, treated him as I said as a son and it was you know always dear Patrick dear John and uh, when when Patrick would come back then in 1913 to Glentis because he never lost touch with his family, he spoke about the children, uh, he spoke about the youngest, particularly young Con growing up, and so on and so forth, and that he was delightful, and so on and so forth, aged about five or six at that time, uh, at the time. But he sent letters to Ken and Dalton from wherever he was. And this is one of them, it's the Glen. Glentis, 28th of August, 1913. 
Uh, dear, my dear Cannon, he's still on those terms with him. Got your letter yesterday in your magazines. You had one of them already, and I'm certain that you could not have much pleasure in reading the stories of the same. But he goes on to say, at present I read Tolstoy and another man, a Russian, with an unpronounceable Russian name. He, he, he discusses all his reading. He was big into Russian and French literature. And as I said before, Zola, Hugo, uh, and these people. And this had a huge effect on him. He's, and Miguel says in one of his letters, there is nothing like Russian realism. You know, the bleak cottage, the... And, of course, Miguel, in his uh, first novel, you can see this uh, all over them. Uh, he now had a base. Uh, he had a bit of comfort. The canon gave him a typewriter. And he was now ready to write. And he was extremely ambitious. And he was still teaching himself. There exist in the States, in his family in the States, law, copies of long lists of words. He was actually learning words to enhance his vocabulary. It was an extraordinary, apart from his own natural ability, obviously, which was great. He was always known as a great reader, even at the few years he was at school. And he was known to come into Glentis and buy the paper twice a week. But... Uh, the, uh, in, in addition to this incredible uh, 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 natural ability, there was the effort as well being put into bettering his writing and so on and so forth. So he, I'm going to now start rushing through. He wrote Children of the Dead End, which appeared in 1914. It was a sensation. This story, so well told, so, uh, so uh, about his own experiences. But in the book, he wrote a critique of society here. And this is where he came a cropper as far as being known in Ireland or uh, his work being known. He blamed the system that he had suffered from, not only for large families and people having children without the means to keep them, not, very, not a very popular view at the time, and I can assure you would be much more popular now. He criticized the local merchants here in Glentis, uh, who were very powerful, uh, under the title of Farley McCone. This was the kind of gombean men sometimes described. The McDevitts were, were in part of the McDevitt Empire, I suppose, because the hotel bought uh, a bit of the McDevitt Institute, which it was a college. Uh, the McDevitt brothers, uh, they made a lot of money uh, on women knitting socks, uh, because there was a big demand for these things, on the hawk system whereby you would give credit, but you would charge interest on it, or you would get goods in return, and so on and so forth. They also did a lot of good, of course. They did, uh, particularly in the later years, they set up a college and they set up funds. But uh, they left uh, the, the, the last, and McDevitt uh, died, was it Hugh or James, I'm not sure which, died in about 1917 and left about 150,000. And all of that was left to the church. And there was a law case about it. And in the law case, McGill's work was quoted from Children of the Dead End. And McGill had seen it, obviously, because he wrote to the canon saying, guess what? Uh, it's a funny old world. My book has been quoted in a, in a, in a court in Dublin. The other, uh, the other target of his attacks was the landlord system. And, of course, here was the, the landlord was the Marcus of Cunningham, uh, 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 antecedent of Henry Mount Charles. Uh, and uh, uh, he wrote about the priest uh, and Father Devaney, who was really Canon McFadden. 
And Canon McFadden had been a hero in the Rosses because he was known as the Patriot Priest because he had resisted the evictions and so on and so forth. And then he was involved in very strange things. Uh, the RIC, he said, I am the law in Guidor. And uh, the, uh, the RIC went to arrest him and one of their officers was killed, beaten to death in the melee. And the canon, you know, was put on trial. He was eventually released. But uh, before he arrived in Glentis in this parish of Inniskeel, uh, he had been sent uh, to the States by the bishop and so on to get him out of the place for a while uh, and, and so on. But Miguel, Miguel went for the Father, Mac, uh, Father Devani in an extraordinary way on the extortion of the peasantry, the extortion of people through offerings at funerals and so on and taxes and so on in order to build himself a fine house that is there and to install in it a lavatory that costs 300 pounds. And uh, I must say some years back, uh, uh, a local, uh, par the local parish priest, this would be in the 70s, uh, told me that McGill was a renegade and a scoundrel, but he took me up and showed me the lavatory and all that beautiful floral, and you can now see it, it's in the museum. <laughs> <laughs> and you can even sit on it, if you wish. But, uh, so, Children of the Dead End became a sensation. McGill followed it up with a sequel from the woman's point of view, the rat pit. And then the war and McGill, who was at home at the time, according to his sister Bridget, who was alive and who I talked to at the time, went back to London and volunteered immediately. You could say that, you know, what choice did he have? He was living in Windsor Castle and uh, he, Canon Dalton's own son, Hugh, was going off to the front. Everybody was going off to the front. Uh, but... He immediately, he, it, it is said, and I don't know if this is true, he could have had a commission through the contacts that Canon Dalton would have had, but turned it down. He wanted to be an ordinary soldier, so he went off as rifleman of the London Irish. The London Irish was composed of people who may have been, had links to Ireland through family, through property, or through family. And uh, he... This put an end to his writing like this, but not, not to be deterred. The young Miguel starts writing immediately during the training in White City and St. Albans and these places. And in spite of the censor, of course it was all under the censor's censorship, um, he wrote articles for the papers and then got them together and got his publisher, Herbert Jenkins was his publisher, became a great friend of his, and published his first book about the First World War, The Training the Amateur Army. They were all amateurs. They'd never seen a rifle in their lives. And he, he documents that from day one. He went on to write a series of books, uh, but his best war book was written in the heat of battle, in the battle which he took, which he took place. He was a stretcher bearer at this stage. In other words, ferrying the dead. Uh, the Great Push, that's his best book. And one of the best books that has been written on the First World War, and there have been many. I mean, there, all those people, Wilfred Owen, Eisen, Isaac Rosenberg, a lot of literature came out of the First World War. Uh, and... Uh, Miguel wrote this at the Battle of Luce, one of the most disastrous, uh, of all the disasters, one of the most disastrous. The British suffered incredible casualties, and they, used, they had used gas for the first time, and the, ga the wind changed, and the gas blew it back on themselves. A total disaster, and uh, I think it was Sir John French lost his job over it. Uh, but... Uh, so that was it. McGill was still, and of course, by the author of Children of the Dead End. Children of the Dead End continued to sell copies. Even after the war, it was selling at the rate of something like 300 per week. You know, this book really caught on in Britain. And of course, nobody in Ireland knew about this. 
uh, it was the, the men who were working in Scotland, where McGill was a big name as well because of his links to Scotland, those men who were later working in the, as navvies brought back the news of McGill and this man who had been censored and who had written about all these abuses and so on and so forth. And it was in that way that I first heard about, about, it, about him. But uh, he, he became a, a major literary figure in Britain during the, uh, during the 20s, certainly. And although he wrote about 20 novels in all, he never achieved, he never achieved the, the power of the first one, Children of the Dead End. Uh, but he wrote several very good books that are well worth, and he created a character based on an abbey he met in his travels, Moleskine Joe, and very good, a uh, uh, very good read. Uh, he traveled widely, uh, very often with his wife. She continued writing those, what do you call them, penny dreadfuls, as uh, she writing novels about love and so on, The Rose of Glen Connell and so, so on. So uh, between them, they were making a lot of money. Uh, Patrick on the Great Push, he wrote to the canon saying that he had made so far 2,000 on the Great Push and 2,000 on, oh, I've forgotten the other. I mean, the, these were, you know, royalties were flowing in. And in, 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 in 1915, uh, when McGill has gone to the front, uh, Herbert Jenkins writes to Cannon saying, at the request of Mr. Patrick McGill, I am sending here with his royalty accounts together with a check. It doesn't say how much. Will you kindly let me have uh, a, a formal receipt? Uh, but um, they became quite wealthy. And the house that they bought in London, up in Hendon, uh, called St. Margaret's, after Margaret, uh, became a literary salon, visited frequently by J.K. Chesterton, the Catholic writer, uh, who stood for one of the twins when they came to have children because they had difficulty in having children. Uh, and, uh, and the other, uh, the other godfather was Canon Dalton. I mean, the, this was, and Galsworthy, John Galsworthy's Foresight Saga and all of that, frequent visitor to the house. So these were, they became quite literary celebrities. Uh, Patrick remained, led a very simple life. He wasn't into Margaret loved dancing and went out dancing with, so, you know, they had a, somebody who would go with her because Patrick didn't want her and so on. But anyway, they, and they traveled to Norway where his books became uh, extremely famous, where he was a celebrity. Uh, the books were translated into French, uh, German I'm not so sure of. The books sold in America. So um, uh, they were... They were very well off. Then in 1920, and then they went to Switzerland, lived for two years in the Alps because one of the, one of the twins suffered from some condition that needed uh, living in the mountains. And indeed, Patrick had a complaint as well, a certain TB, and that could have come from the gas on the front. And uh, so they went to Les Ains, in Switzerland, lived an idyllic life there for two years, and uh, Patrick would make the odd foray back to give a lecture and so on. He, would, he gave many lectures in Scotland, and he would tell the story of his upbringing and so on, and repeat some of the things he said in the book about big families and so on. And some Irish people, some Irish men, navvies who were working there, who would go because Patrick McGill, an Irishman, and they would almost jump up and hit him and knock him off the stage. They didn't want to hear this at all. They thought he was letting down the side, you know, so that, uh, that that's the other side of it. But anyway, they, in 1929, he had written a play on the First World War called Suspense, 
and then they went to, in, in London. And then they went to uh, New York with that and were going to uh, go on lecture tour. And they had in mind the movies. The movies were starting, uh, the talkies were starting at the time. And they went to Hollywood and so on and so forth, but they hit on bad times. Uh, the play was a flop. Uh, nobody understood the Cockney. It was the ordinary Cockney soldiers who were in it. Nobody understood them, etc., etc. And, and nobody cared. This was the depression we were getting into. Anyway, they hit on very bad times. Eventually, Patrick uh, developed multiple sclerosis and gradually became unable to write. And anything he did write was probably written by his wife, Margaret. Uh, the only thing he ended up writing were little poems to his children on their birthdays. But he became quite eccentric, or maybe he had always been a bit eccentric, but his children had very little, uh, you know, it was the mother really who ran things. She set up a drama school in order to make the Hollywood British drama school in order to make money to train people for the talkies and, and so on. So... They, they, they lived from hand to mouth, very difficult existence until the three girls, uh, Patricia, Sheila, uh, Patricia, Christine, and Sheila, uh, then grew up and uh, supported the family. Uh, went, into a lot, went into publishing very much so. And, uh, uh, and uh, then he disappeared. I mean, nobody knew where he was. Nobody around here, nobody in Ireland, his family. And I think Mary Claire knows all of this in Pather. And I began to say, well, now, how are we going to find out where he is? Because we knew he was in the States. So I had the idea of putting, putting a letter in the New York Times Review of Books. That's always a good way of finding something or somebody, put a letter and I got a reply. The reply was from Sheila, his daughter in New York, asked me who I was, what did, what did I want to know about Patrick McGill, what was this about. I wrote back and told her the story that her, his family would love to contact him. We all would like to contact him. We wonder where he is, and so on and so forth. And uh, she then wrote back and told me a lot more details. And then his other daughter, Patricia, did the same. Uh, but he had died at this stage. It was too late. I wrote, and I think it was about 71, uh, shortly after I came back from France and joined RTE. And uh, he had died in 63, as I said earlier today, on the day that President Kennedy was assassinated. He died in Florida, actually, because he had been brought to Florida for health reasons and so on. And, but it was then, uh, there were, I noticed from, you know, the thing you sign at a funeral or whatever, or at a, 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 or at a, a remains, um, there were 10 people, really, 10 people with, most of them with foreign names, who signed the thing. Uh, I think how, uh, how lonely, really. And uh, he, he, his remains were brought to uh, Fall River in Massachusetts. That's where uh, Patricia was living with her family. She had married a librarian, lovely man, Owen McGowan, large family. And she was looking after the mother, so they thought, have the remains near to the mother. So he is, he is buried today in Fall River, Massachusetts. So it... it I've only touched on uh, some of it. It was an extraordinary adventure and an extraordinary story in, in Irish literature. Now, his writing is criticized for being, you know, too, uh, too melodramatic and this and that. And sometimes, actually, his grammar is not quite, quite what it should be. In spite of all of that, the achievement is phenomenal. And in fact, I discovered that he, 
1918, he had been told by a Norwegian journalist, because he was very much in touch with Norway for some reason, I think more than Denmark, that he was being considered for a Nobel Prize uh, uh, for Children of the Dead End and the Rat Pit. So I, I, I don't know. I, one would have to go into the records of the Nobel Committee or whatever. But uh, the achievement, it can be criticized for this and for that. The poetry wouldn't be every But uh, if you look at, if you look at the, the poem uh, that is in the program, uh, Going Home, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, the, the front cover, the back of the front cover. It's a beautiful, it was written when he was 19, and it was written in, in a hut in Kinloch Laven, Doherty Shack. And it's a beautifully composed, beautifully sentimental. When he wrote about Glentis and the Glen, he was at his best. Uh, so, uh, Better. I wanted to quote a lot more, but there's just, I had too much to do. But uh, his, his, lyrical, his lyrical descriptions, even in the heat of battle, when he comes out at night and the, the, the shells and the shelling and the colours and so on and so forth, and he invariably thinks, of course, of the glen, his own glen and he compares it. And that, it, it's what makes it so sad, I think, that he never got the chance to come back because he had kept up contact and he had been so kind to his family over the years. Uh, he had a brother, John, who was next to him and he looked after that, that, that uh, brother, you know, uh, who stayed with him in London for a time and he carried him up to bed. I think it was polio he had, uh, I'm not sure. And he carried him up to bed at night and all of that. He was a very, very kind, uh, extraordinary human being. And uh, it's just a pity that because of the system here, his work has never really got the recognition that it has deserved. We've done, I suppose, a certain amount uh, by the McGill School and people coming and asking, well, who was Patrick McGill? Well, I suppose, I hope I've told you that's who he was. So. Oh, yeah, I just want to show you, just a few quick to show you. I mean, this guy had film star looks which helped. I mean, he didn't, all the journalists who went to interview him after the success of Children of Ed End in Windsor Castle found not a big brute of a navvy, you know, that they expected, but, but a kind of a film star looks just afflicted. This is posed. This is, this is for publicity purposes. The pick, the pick is there and so on. And, uh, but... Uh, and, of course, he has the McGill looks, and it's reproduced in the family still to this day. Uh, and, of course, the, the, in, the, in the way of the moleskins that were tied. You know, look at on, you see? Yeah, I mean, fine-looking young fella. Uh, so uh, all of that combined to... Uh, to uh, this is a card, and the, you'll be glad to hear... Delightful weather still continues here. This is Lentis. Usually, usually he described it, it is raining cats and dogs and the harvest is almost safe. Well, this was, the, this was another card, the roof garden of the Port New Hotel, which will be known to many here. And uh, all now disappeared in rather tragic circumstances. And next... That's, the, that's a very historic, that was a postcard of the Harvest Fair, if there are people from Glentis. That's the Harvest Fair, it's up obviously behind the barracks, <coughs> not right, and the hotel would be down there. Uh, but uh, that, this was a card to, to, to Canon Dalton, and, it's, and that's Glentis as it was around that time. Uh, no, that's, that's later, it's not at that time. But there was a fair green, you see the fair green, 
that's presumably, and the const constabulary barracks, that was where the, the yeah, that's great. Right. That's where the harvest fair was held. And that's ruins of the First World War that he sent to Cannon North to, to give them an idea. And that's uh, Miguel as a, a London a Rifleman 3008. And that's him again. So uh, that's the story, as much as I can tell you. <laughs> now, now, we all needed.